Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Welcome back to the strategy of voting. Today's lecture is on the completeness axiom. So remember that we're talking about an individual's preferences and how we need to be able to construct those individual's preferences in a particular way so that those preferences actually make coherent sense. And this lecture will be on just one such axiom that this has to fulfill, which is called the completeness axiom. So again, think back to just five alternatives, A, B, C, D, and E. These are the five options that can be implemented. And how we define a complete preference relation is as follows. You have a complete preference relation if, for any two distinct alternatives, X and Y, one of the following must hold. Either you prefer X to Y, or you prefer Y to X, or you're indifferent between X and Y. What this means in just plain English is that you must be able to express preference or indifference. If I say, do you like X or do you like Y? You have to tell me that you like one or the other or you're indifferent between the two. Decline to state here is not an option. If I say, do you like X or do you like Y? You can't be like, eh. You can say, I don't really care. I'm indifferent between the two, but you can't just decline to respond. I have to know whether one is true, you prefer X to Y, X, P, Y, or two is true, you prefer Y to X or Y, P, X, or number three is true, you're indifferent between X and Y, X, I, Y. One of those three things needs to be told to me, and you have to be able to tell me those things in a consistent manner. You can't just be like, eh. Not an option. You have to be able to state something. So to see what this looks like when we're mapping out preferences, you can look at it like this. This is a complete preference relation. It's complete because if you look at any two alternatives, for example, E and A, then we have a stated preference relation. This individual prefers E to A. If you take another one, say E and B, then that individual is indifferent between E and B. You can see the two arrows that run in between E and B there. Likewise, if we look at B and C, this individual prefers B to C. If you take any two alternatives here, you see the stated preference relation. So that's a complete preference relation. This is in contrast to an incomplete preference relation, which would look like this. It just takes one simple pair of alternatives to screw this all up. So this individual has a complete preference relation for everything except for the pair of alternatives E and A. If you ask this individual, do you prefer E or A? This individual will be like, eh, there's nothing there. There's no indifference, there's no preference. So because of the, the virtue that this individual just has one pair of alternatives for which there is no stated preference means that this preference relation as a whole is not complete. So you need to have a stated preference or indifference for all pairs of alternatives. Even one simple error here screws up the entire thing. This individual does not have a complete preference relation. Now, in interpreting how this preference relation axiom, this completeness axiom, is useful or not, I think that it's actually not that strong of an axiom if you have a reasonable number of alternatives. Because if you have a reasonable number of alternatives, then the number of preference relations that you need to state is relatively small. So in the example with A, B, C, D, and E, when you only have five alternatives, that means there's only 10 preference relations that you have to be able to state in order for your preference relation to be complete. And when you look at most elections, you have a small number of, of alternatives. I think in the last presidential election, I think that there were only eight alternatives on the ballot. So that's a fairly small number of preference relations that I'd have to be able to state. And so that's fine. In a lot of situations, you're simply voting yes or no on a ballot. And so that's a very minimal preference relation because you have to just be able to say whether you prefer yes on the ballot or no on the ballot or you're indifferent between the two. So when we're dealing with a small number of alternatives, this sort of completeness axiom is all well and good. The problem, of course, is when you have a large number of alternatives. So if we bump up the number of alternatives to 101 alternatives, if I did my math right, then there are now 5,050 preference relations. And that's going to be pretty difficult. If you were voting in an election for the president of the United States and all 300 million people who lived in the United States were eligible to vote, then there's no way that your preference relation is going to be complete there because you're going to be like, I have no idea on a lot of pairs of alternatives. So that's when you can run into problems with preference relations or completeness of preference relations when you have a large number of alternatives. But for the types of things we're interested in, I don't think that this is too difficult because of the virtue of the fact that the number of alternatives that we'll be looking at usually tends to be pretty small. So the completeness axiom, very reasonable in a number, in it, when there are a small number of alternatives and much more difficult, much more unreasonable when there are a large number of alternatives. But again, I don't think it's a big deal for what we're talking about because we're going to be mostly aiming towards a small number of alternatives. All right, that wraps up this video on the completeness axiom. In the next video, we will talk about the transitivity axiom. Join me then.